All right. Thanks, everybody, for grabbing a seat. And uh, welcome to the first Bay Area GPU Compute Meetup. Uh, this is a joint initiative between Kinetica and our most strategic partner, NVIDIA. Um, my name is Chris Prendergast. I'll be the moderator. I run business development and alliances for Kinetica. Before we get started, a couple of housekeeping things. Um, there's no photography or recording allowed during this session, so if anybody sees that, we're going to have those big, scary security guys come and probably take it away from you. Um, and secondly, there was a uh, cell phone that we found lying around on the floor. So I don't know if anybody had lost a cell phone, but if you did, it is uh, out up front with, uh, with Teresa. So this is the first in a series of meetups that we're going to have. Um, the second one will be in February in North Beach in San Francisco. Um, you can follow us on meetup.com and you can get all the details about when and where everything is going to come from there. Um, so with that, the first person that's going to be speaking today will be the Senior Director of Deep Learning and Analytics from NVIDIA, a gentleman named John Barco. He's got over 20 years of experience across a lot of industry-leading organizations like uh, Sun and SGI. Um, so he's also a very firm believer, like the rest of us, like the partnership between Kinetic and NVIDIA is really on the forefront of a lot of next generation data processing and analytic movements that a lot of customers are going to benefit from. So with that, I'll turn it over to John and he'll take it from here. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Am I going the wrong way? All right, cool. All right, so uh, my name is John Barco, as Chris said, and I did want to just take a few minutes to set some of the context for the conversation that the Connecticut guys are going to do a little bit later, um, as well as the demos that they're going to show. Um, first of all, I'm sure everybody knows who NVIDIA is, right? Gaming company is the is the history of the of the company. 100 million gamers worldwide, 400,000 developers. Um, but what you may not know is, um, you know, some of the other markets that that Nvidia is present in and and investing in. Um, and you know, one of those areas is the is the enterprise. And so, the application that we're going to be talking about the solutions or we're going to be talking about are really application or really enterprise focused. But all the technology that is, um, you know, has been developed at NVIDIA is being applied to a number of different markets, uh, professional visualization, AR, um, uh, you know, uh, virtual reality, uh, augmented reality. Uh, the automotive space is huge for NVIDIA with ent autonomous driving systems. Um, and you can kind of go down the line, right? If you, uh, if you go to our website and check out all the different areas, you'll be really surprised about all the different uh, areas of, of investment that, uh, that we're making today. And so the key thing, you know, with uh, NVIDIA is that when we looked at the enterprise market. We looked at, you know, a number of different trends. And one of the trends that we saw is that, you know, starting in 2008, 2009, HDFS was released. And organizations started to build massive data centers with um, uh, data warehouses, data lakes. And the challenge that organizations had and still have is that, it's one thing to capture and collect all the data, but it's another thing to actually get insight from that data. And I, I know you guys have, have heard this a million times, right? But you know, one of the stats I, I hear a lot from different folks is that today, roughly 75% of all the data that's captured today and, and stored is not u utilized, right? There's just not enough capacity from a compute perspective um, to to take advantage of, of all the data. And that's ironic because as we move into the era of, of AI, right, you actually need that data, right? And so um, it's, 
it, you know, we're essentially at an inflection point in the, in the industry where we've gone from too much data to now we don't have enough data, right? Because you need the data to train models to be, uh, to make the, the models more intelligent. If you take a look at the industry just from a, um, a CPU and GPU perspective, uh, uh, you'll notice right a, a divergence happening about 10 years ago, right? Um, the CPU market uh, used to follow Moore's law. It's it, it can't anymore. It's basically hit a physics wall, and so um, you know roughly 10 years ago. The, uh, the, the development of, of the uh, graphics processing unit, um, it, it started to take off, right? And, and today, if you look at where we are with our products and our technology versus uh, Intel and AMD, we're roughly at a, a 5x uh, performance gain or difference, right? And so it's a significant amount of uh, a, a difference in the in the compute power that's available today versus what's available on the on the CPU only systems. The the question that we always get is so what do you do with all the compute power, right, that GPUs deliver? Right? There's use cases across every single industry. I I, I haven't found an industry where you can't apply uh, the the GPU compute power to to solving some uh, some use case uh, doesn't matter what it is if it's you know retail it could be anything from you know customer sentiment analysis uh, in uh, you know in, in finance it's uh, risk analysis in other industries it's you know cybersecurity it doesn't matter I mean it, there are absolutely tons of different use cases for every single industry and so that's the uh, that's really the 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 shift that's happened is um, today, now that we've got the power, right, of GPU, we can really start to address a lot of these different use cases that, have, that haven't been able to be done before. You know, our take with uh, GPU technology basically is that, you know, uh, organizations that have deployed these, these products and these solutions on the analysis side, they've they've been able to gain you know anywhere from 50 to 100 times the performance. Um, on the visualization side, it's a, a same kind of order of magnitude. It's roughly 100x the size of data that they're able to deal with. The key thing, though, with that is that they're able to do it on roughly 40x less investment on the infrastructure side. And so if you think about that right you're getting 100 times the performance 100 times the the ability to work with large data but the investment that you need the actual hardware that you need in your data center is significantly less than on uh, uh, just a CPU based systems all right so a lot of the technology that we have today is being used to to build out different AI type of models um, in, in a lot of different industries. Um, the, uh, you know, the, there's, there's, there's everything from uh, Major League Baseball who's using AI for doing predictive analytics uh, in, the, in the healthcare space. Uh, Mass General in uh, Massachusetts is using it for doing advancements around radiology. I talked about autonomous driving. Every car manufacturer has an embedded NVIDIA system or is working with NVIDIA on, embedding, uh, on an embedded system. And so the, uh, you know, there, there's just a huge vast array of, of different use cases that uh, folks are using for uh, using our systems for, for AI. One of, the key deliver, one of the key products that we actually have delivered to the market over the last year is called the NVIDIA DGX1. And this is NVIDIA's first purpose-built supercomputer for accelerated analytics and uh, for AI. The key with this product is that this is a, a completely integrated solution, right? So we've uh, 
uh, optimized everything within the box, the graphics drivers, the libraries, the AI toolkits. It offers a platform for the next generation partner products like Kinetica. Um, and so there are a number of different companies that are using DGX again for not just the, the, the AI research, but also for accelerated analytics. This is a, a, a crazy fast box. I mean, this thing is a 3U rack unit delivering roughly the same compute horsepower as a, a 250 x86 servers. It's 170 teraflops of, of compute power. So it's, it's just, it's radically uh, changing how, you know, folks look at solutions for, uh, for this space. One of the key architectural pieces to this product is NVLink. So this is a uh, NVIDIA developed uh, product uh, uh, component, and it basically is a cube mesh architecture that enables up to, I think the slide says 120 gigabytes per second for bi-directional peer traffic, but I think it's actually 160 gigabytes per second. And so we've done some um, innovation that, uh, that enables the DGX box to, to really stand on its own versus the, the uh, uh, competitive boxes that have individual cards put in. Um, this is just the start, right? So um, next generation products will, will have uh, advancements way beyond what, uh, than what we offer today. All right, so the other question we get is, you know, where do, we, where do you start? So I'm interested in doing AI or accelerated analytics. Um, how, can I, how, can I get it, how can I get into it, right? And so there's a number of, of, uh, of solutions and offerings that, uh, that are available. One is just through our OEM partners that have embedded NVIDIA product in it. I talked about the DGX1. That's uh, also a solution, but also GPU-enabled cloud services are available through Amazon, through Google, through all the different providers as well. So one of the key things is just knowing, uh, you know, where the, the data uh, resides, right? So if you're, if you're thinking about getting into this and you do all of your work in AWS, you may want to think about using the GPU services from AWS, right, for data locality. If everything's on-prem, then DGX is a perfect solution for you. All right, so with that, I'm going to flip it over to Mark, I believe, and or Chris, Mark or Chris. Uh, sorry, before Mark Brooks comes, um, is there anybody named Jordan in the room? Jordan? Don't be shy. There was uh, an Uber driver came and they dropped off a set of keys uh, that was left in an Uber by somebody named Jordan. So if you are Jordan, okay, now everybody's named Jordan. You're looking in your pockets. Um, all right, there you go. So here you go. You won our exclusive raffle and our partnership with Uber. You get your own stuff back. Congratulations. <laughs> All right, so next up is Mark Brooks, and he'll be talking a little bit about Kinetica and our GPU enhanced solution. So here you go, Mark. Oh, gotta turn this on. Hang on. I got this thing. Is this working? Yep. Yep. You hear me all right? Is that working? All right. So I'm Mark Brooks from Kinetica. I'm a field guy. A um, couple of questions. This is a big turnout for a meetup, I got to say. And uh, they didn't show any code in the first part. So uh, uh, developers out there? People writing Python, what, uh, Java, C++, CUDA. Who's doing C++ CUDA? Ooh, good, good, good. good. All right. Uh, that's going to be the second half. I got a few slides, and then I'm going to try to show you some running code. I picked Python, OK? I uh, didn't know. Um, so we're very pleased to be here, <coughs> partnered with NVIDIA. The, uh, as I'll show you in the slides, we were designed, so at the core, we're a database. We're an analytics database built from the ground up to exploit GPUs, okay? It's not a bolt-on. We were designed for GPUs. We'll get into this. But 
this gives us some performance characteristics that are unique in the field. We scale horizontally. We scale within multiple GPUs in a box. We scale across multiple boxes. Um, and what we're just, we released it, was it this morning we released it? I think yesterday or this morning, we released what we're calling our, we got multiple names for it, our UDF framework, user-defined functions, or the integration of AI and BI, which is a, a nice high-level way to look at it. So I'm going to talk about that, which is really why NVIDIA and, and Kinetic are here together today, because prior to this, we did sort of parallel play. We got our database running on GPUs. Machine learning, you know, data scientists said, hey, can I run my stuff on your GPUs? And the answer was, well, yeah, you can, kind of, some of the parts, right? They, you know, you're running your machine learning libraries, you're running our database, but they weren't tightly coupled. So what, we've, what we're, I'm going to show you a little bit later, is a framework that allows your machine learning libraries to be dropped into the database and operate in parallel and to be invoked from database calls. Okay, so that's a very interesting convergence of AI and BI. Now I'm going to start with just the database. Um, and the integration, and I put it this way, part of what's for me personally interesting about Kinetica is in large enterprises, you have groups doing machine learning. Machine learning poster child for you know, GPU you know, computation, right? Dozens of people doing machine learning inside a large bank, say. Thousands of people who just wish their analytics were faster. All right? And there's problems of how you get machine learning or data science routines to be of value to the enterprise. How do you get those models back into production? How do you operationalize models? So one pattern that we're going to get into a little bit is a common practice of data science would be a data scientist grabs some data and runs away with it and puts it on their desktop and works on it and comes up with something of value and shows it to people. The question of how this can be operationalized, how that model can be put in production, is uh, in part organizational, it's part tooling, it's part a lot of things. So for the tooling aspect, that's where we come in. So we will talk about stuff like that. Um, so the back, background of Kinetica. So we, in 2009 time frame, I say we, I wasn't involved yet, but the, the founders, the, the people who started Kinetica, uh, were in the um, US government contractors in, uh, in the Army Defense Department, working for three-letter agencies who needed faster analytics and went through every type of system known to, uh, to the database space. Hadoop, HBase, NoSQL, Mongo, you name it. Uh, spent a lot of time building out some of the largest HBase clusters, put security on HBase, you know, for, to create a, a Cumulo. They're like, by the way, can I just ask, are people familiar with Hadoop? Have many people worked with Hadoop? Excellent. Anyone doing real-time SQL on Hadoop? All right, all right. I, I, look, I spent four years at Cloudera uh, arguing for uh, doing uh, SQL. It's, that's pushing a rock up a hill, right? It's, it's a really hard challenge to do real-time SQL. So forgive me if I've attempted to sell you Hadoop software. Um, still value for Hadoop, no question, right? Hadoop at scale, uh, batch processing, starting to become stable, right? Um, by the way, at Kinetica, my peers, we've got people from Hortonworks, Cloudera, MapR. The joke is, what do they three agree on? The answer is Kinetica. Um, so, all right, so uh, the requirement that drove the product initially were hundreds of real-time data feeds coming from drones, from telemetry, from a you know, variety of different data sources. The mission being to find bad guys before bad things happened, right, for the intelligence community. This is a, a phenomenal geospatial, real-time, analytic set of requirements. Uh, more than 250 different data feeds. So you can imagine that a lot of existing database technology did not keep up, including some of the biggest names, and money was not really an option. So the founders of Kinetica, at the time, called GIS Federal, GIS Federal. Then we evolved for a name which I actually quite liked, a very fun name. When I joined, we were GPUDB. No, no, a good functional name, right? I mean, I love that it does like that GPUDB, right? 
And then um, for many of us, went home and told my wife, you work for GPUD-D? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so we've grown up a little. We're Kinetica, my real name, okay. But um, in the meantime, being successful in the US government for the um, uh, intelligence community, we then picked up US Postal Service. We, we were awarded an IDC award. And the Postal Service was trying to find a system that could keep up. They'd, be, they'd been granted permission to have um, breadcrumbs emitted by postal carriers and postal vehicles. But they didn't have a system to catch those breadcrumbs, much less do analytics on it. So they, they heard about our award, the work we did for the, uh, um, for the government, for the intelligence community. And the US Postal Service became our first essentially non-military customer and have been running since, I think, 2014. Um, high availability, 20,000 users on the system, showing uh, routing information. If, if, uh, what's the way to optimize routing? If postal carriers don't you know, come in, well, how do you route pack? This is beautiful, geospatial, very high you know, velocity data feeds from instrumentation. It's kind of a very IoT-ish app. Um, since then, we picked up PG&E and, and many others. I'm not sure if I can name them, so I won't. But let's say healthcare, pharmacy, um, we, the company started to take off. And we've moved our headquarters to San Francisco, and so we're, we're pretty local. OK. Uh, I think John covered this earlier, but it's a, it's a central part of why another database, right? I think when I joined, the question was, stop the insanity, right? Like, how many databases are there out there? There's a lot. There's a whole bunch. Um, why do you need another database? So here's, here's our argument, why do you need another database? Is to just look at the history of the evolution of databases. So uh, the patterns of a data warehouse, very well respected. There's data warehouse practice in you know, every large organization. No question there. Star schemas, the whole deal. Um, these systems have sort of hit the wall. And this is where Hadoop came and, and said, hey, here's a really cost efficient way to scale out storage. Do batch processing at scale on commodity hardware. Hadoop continues to be a beautiful price performance leader, the great target for archival storage, right? Batch processing, maybe real time, not so much. So to try to get to real time, and at this point now, memory's getting cheaper, all right? So we did a lot of implementations where um, people buy 300 boxes with 64 gigs of RAM. They used to sound like a lot, right? And then they come by and they upgrade them to 256 gigs of RAM. RAM is cheaper, right? Uh, nowadays, 512 or one terabyte, right? RAM is cheaper. So memory-based databases come up. SAP HANA, big deal. Um, MemSQL, there's others, right? So essentially, at this point, you have fast disks, fast networks, fast I.O., uh, lots of memory. These systems reveal themselves to be compute bound. Right? It's the fourth wall, right? You know, uh, that's it. A 300 node Spark cluster is not unusual, right? How, if, you wanna, if you have large data sets and you want to bring a lot of compute to be able to keep up with that analytics, another 100 nodes, right? This is a way to address, you get very wide horizontal sprawl. And hardware vendors love it, right? I mean, this, uh, Hadoop was a wonderful thing for you know, the big hardware vendors, because a 1,000 node cluster is not that unusual. OK, the operational cost of that's ridiculous, right? Um, OK, so the problem being that uh, these systems are compute bound, enter the GPU. Kinetica was built from the ground up to exploit GPUs to be an analytic database. It was not a bolt-on. And we can t there's, there's, there's a lot of companies who are attempting to bolt-on GPUs now, OK? Which means they have to pay the price of pulling data out of whatever format they have it in already to maybe flatten it, parallelize it, to push it to the GPU, and then get the results. So that's different than our system was designed from the ground up, purpose-built for the GPU. So we have simple, flat data structures. And uh, we've spent a lot of time optimizing how you pull data out of memory and feed it to the GPU. All right. So let me pull this. So um, where do we sit? The first question is, like, why do you need another database? OK, so maybe. But where would it sit? So we sit being primarily, and again, I'll stress the three things. We are primarily an in-memory database, horizontal scaling, um, GPU uh, accelerated. OK. We don't hold petabytes of data. We're not a replacement for your data lake. So we typically sit at the, on top of that, 
the, the Ferrari, right? We are the high speed, high value database for your most important data. So very commonly for the freshest data. We don't replace transactional systems. We don't replace the data lake. Uh, and I'll show you the APIs and I'll show you some running code in just a little bit here. Um, but you can pipe things into here. Let's go over here. Okay. This is a little elaboration. The reason I asked the Hadoop question is, are people familiar with Lambda architectures? All right, so uh, this, this was, all right, guilty. I've already apologized, right? This is promoted as a best practice, and in many ways it is, right? It is, if you, have, if you assume Hadoop, okay, or some big data lake, and that's a, that's a reasonable assumption because you want to keep all your data. Right? You want to maximize, you want to retain all your data because there are historical analytics that have great value. So there's typically a, a data lake. In any enterprise, large data infrastructure, you've got a data lake. If you had streaming data coming in, for all the obvious reasons that everyone knows about now, you've got streaming data coming in, you've got a data lake, how can you act quickly on the data that's streaming in? One path is you write it to Hadoop as fast as you can, and then you pull it out into an analytics tool as fast as you can. It's not that many moving parts, but it's inherently batchy, and the batches there are in the like five minute, right? You're using a flume or something like that to batch stuff up, and you write it a Hadoop, and then you pull it out. Okay, people want faster than that. Um, Spark, Spark streaming, Storm, right? There's there's obviously new technologies that that are a vast improvement that attempt to like through Spark streaming. Uh, maybe still implement a, a bit of a batch framework, which is fine, a batch time window, micro batch, that's still valid for most use cases. You've got Storm, you've got Flink, you've got other things that can act on data as it flies in. But the point is, those technologies, and nothing wrong with them, there's still a place for them. And there's a question, how many technologies do you need right, in, in your system? But the inherent limitation of those technologies is, with their limited compute, they can only do a limited amount of analytics. So I, if I've got streaming data coming in, I can look at what's happened in the past five minutes. I can look at what's happened, you know, uh, okay, let's say I can look at five minutes, right? I can tell you, was there a network intrusion? Was there some anomaly that happened? Was this transaction more than one standard deviation greater than the five minute average, okay? Inherently limited. So what what system designers want would be a way to react to a streaming event quickly. Is this transaction more than one standard deviation greater than their three-year average? Okay, so that's a meaningful comparison. You want to make that assessment as the event flows through the speed layer. So to do that with the data lake, you would run batch processes. You would, pr you would generate um, aggregates. You'd calculate the average transaction size for every customer like once an hour, and you'd serve it up to the speed layer. You'd, you'd push it into a NoSQL or, or into some sort of memory cache. You'd make that available to the speed layer to quickly reference. Is this transaction greater than the, you know, than the three-year average for this customer? Well, I just calculated that an hour ago. So you could actually make the comparison. A lot of moving parts. It can work. Great operational complexity. They're brittle. How many pieces of infrastructure have to work correctly. How do you take your Hadoop cluster down for maintenance? How do you apply a patch, right? Um, how do you do security? I mean, it's like, it can work, and some shops have done a great job, and it is very complicated. On the slide here, I've simply dropped Kinetica into that speed layer, because it can do both those things. It's got the super low latency, millisecond, subsecond, and put get scan semantics that you'd want from a from like a NoSQL. But it can compute very deep historical aggregates on the fly without needing to pre-calculate them and serve them up. Right? So this is um, a very powerful way to simplify, to take the pressure to decouple the requirement of a Lambda architecture, things are basically the same. I still got Kafka, I still pick up events, I still have the data lake, but by just swapping out, putting Kinetica in that speed layer, then you can have the benefits of being able to do meaningful, deep analytics in real time or near real time as you process events 
without having to make multiple round trips to recalculate aggregate things like that to the database. So um, if we walk into a Hadoop shop, a not unusual story is <coughs> we have a new next-gen enterprise reporting app, something like that. right? Or, uh, and we wrote it in Spark, and it worked great in dev. And any one report runs perfectly. But at concurrency, when I need to run 100 simultaneous reports, then it hits the wall. It just hits the wall. And, uh, and generally, if you start profiling, they're just compute bound. Right? And is the answer add another 100 nodes of Spark? You know, I don't know. Um, OK, having said all that, Many of our customers don't have Hadoop. There's no need for Hadoop. Sometimes when I go too far deep into this hole, I'm digging for myself here. Um, you know, there's a perception that, that you must have. You don't, you don't need to do it. We work fine as a standalone database. Many of our implementations were just a standalone database. People wire events into us. They run analytics, and we're done. But this view is where it fits into a larger um, uh, data environment. OK, so starting to get into the, uh, the new stuff. So I talked about fast streaming data. We have also um, interactive location-based analytics. We used to call it geospatial analytics, but that kind of pigeonholed us. But, and part of this is possible because we got the GPUs. I mean, it's, it's wonderful, crazy. It's, 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 uh, it's pretty interesting to have that much compute available. All right? So we can do geospatial stuff. We can compute visualizations server-side. Okay? Terrible pattern is when you have a billion events and you want to draw a picture of it. Terrible pattern is to pull a billion events over the network from your database into your BI tool and try to draw a picture of it. Right? It clogs your network. A nice thing to do is just, hey, delegate that to the GPUs, let the GPUs generate the image and return a PNG file. Okay, I'll show you that. So now um, we've got the geospatial stuff, the interactive location-based analytics. We've got this fast analytic database. And we're bringing to it now another simpler way, in-database analytics. This is the way of saying third party, your code, um, common third party libraries, machine learning libraries, and just bumping them up against the database and allowing you to call them together. So that's, that's where we're going. All right, so talk about this one. I think I already gave away the punchline on this one in my early remarks, but essentially, it's really common to see machine learning poster child for GPUs, right? And machine learning has just caught fire, and, and uh, what, what can you say? Um, very, very interesting. I tell my kids who are in college, do that. Right? It's a bright future. Um, it's very hard to get the value of machine learning out back into production, get it operationalized, get your models not only just trained up on a set of data, but constantly retrained on new data that comes in. You, some, some shops can do it, many can't. Many shops, the data scientists sit over here, they go to lunch together, they've got data that they've squirreled away. And they, they, build, they, they may do great data science. I'll give you an example for a large healthcare company. Large healthcare company, uh, data scientists figured out that if they grabbed all of the um, doctor's notes from patient encounters and did some machine learning on it, they could flag where there was likely a bad diagnosis code. Okay? So if a doctor has put a bad diagnosis code, 57 instead of 75 as they fill out that silly form while they're trying to you know, do the electronic medical record, a very useful form, right? All sorts of bad things happen downstream. The wrong tests get ordered. Maybe the actual condition is not treated. The patient could die, right? It's a, it's a, it's a terrible thing to have a wrong diagnosis code. So uh, data scientist, one guy, says, I bet I could flag that. I bet if I did natural language processing of the doctor's notes, I could flag it. If the notes said, uh, mentioned the word blood sugar, and the, the diagnosis code they wrote was transposed. It wasn't diabetic. It was the other way. They just, you know, it's, they, they say, hey, what if, what if we examine higher chance of it being a diabetic diagnosis if the word blood sugar appear in the notes? Let me just check and see if it's a transposed for, you know, the diabetic uh, condition, right? Succeeded in flagging a tremendous percentage, even if it's only, uh, you know, a 5, 6, 10 percent, you know, small. It's still hard work, right? Never made it into production. 
A phenomenal use case, right? That, that patient quality of care would have improved and it never made it production because of just the bureaucratic lethargy. He, the data scientist, was working on data kind of slipped to him because, you know, it's very, people own data, that's right? And, uh, and then he showed his result. It was very interesting. And people, you know, it was just too hard operation to get this in production. Okay, so that's just one story. That's what's being depicted over here, where data scientists commonly get data, right? They get it, they, they extract data somehow out of business systems. They do their work, and then what? How does it get back in? Now, one shop that I visited that I thought had a great approach to this and were very successful in getting data science work back into production. They did it by having different uh, technical team members sit in pods. They had a data scientist sit with a developer and sit with a DevOps person. And these three people were jointly responsible. Data scientist comes up with something brilliant. Developer helps write the glue code so it can actually run against real data. DevOps person gets it deployed in production. And they can iterate. And this was a beautiful thing, right? It's, it was a very unusual. Now there's also some friction in the workplace because data scientists like to have lunch with the other disks, right? Like, but but that, I thought that was a great approach to, um, uh, to trying to address this problem. We are also looking at it through tooling. So what, all right, let me see how many builds are on this slide. Okay, so by tooling, <clears throat> it gets to the question, why do data scientists, this is not a joke, it sounds like, why do data scientists like squirrel away their own data? I have no punchline for this, right? Because data is hard to get, data is dirty, most people spend, you know, most data scientists spend most of their time, you know, cleaning data, right? And once they've cleaned some data, right? There's, there's a lot of reasons. Um, with Kinetica, but, but one reason is data is just too slow, or it's just it's too hard to get to, and I can't do stuff. I mean, this is what, some code that I'm gonna run for in a second to try to make clear the point. If Kinetic is the database in this mix, the data scientist may find it's just as fast. It looks like they're running against local data. It's th that fast. And if I can work on a four billion row data set, and I can do aggregation sub-second, and I can do group buys, I can do feature selection against the multi-billion row data set in real time or near real time, this is very interesting. It lessens the, the need for the data scientists to grab data just because they can run it locally. Um, what this also means then, with this new framework that I'm describing and alluding to, um, if they can drop their libraries onto the database and have it called from the database, then there's a better chance that their code is closer to being operationalized, right? This still may not be a production system, but instead of them running a main program from a command line on a shell on their desktop, they could actually have it be invoked by the database. And uh, I'm gonna go more into that. But this is the point, this is the converge. The AI stuff is, is uh, what's being added here. The BI is what we've had all, all along, which is that we've got these fast analytics in the database. Um, here, hopefully not being too salesy, if so, I apologize. But I'll tell you, we just, we just completed one of the shortest proof of concepts I've ever been involved with. Let me tell you, when you do a Hadoop proof of concept, right, it takes, it takes a long time. Um, um, we just did a proof of concept where a Tableau workbook, very well known to the business, essentially boring, right, roll up of any meaningful set of business KPIs. Um, to a technical person, they all look the same, right? This one looked the same, but... Uh, you know, there was business stuff. This was used by business users in their weekly executive meetings, so it was really important. Um, it took two minutes to run, two minutes to load the Tableau workbook on Teradata, and then it took uh, 12 to 15 seconds per page click, okay? And, and, and the click was in front of a bunch of executives, let's, let's filter by gender, let's filter by age group, right? It was a casino property, right? And so we want to figure out where, who's spending money, where should we devote our marketing dollars, right? Big meetings like that. And you want to slice and dice the data. And it took 12 to 15 seconds, like you, you filter by gender, which is not a horrible result, but it was awkward. They wanted something faster. So we were given the same workbook, the same data. We did this one on the cloud. And it took two minutes to load on Terry. It took five seconds to load on Kinetica. And it took three to five seconds per click, right? So it was, uh, you know, the, the analytics at this point is very well served by having GPUs as, as the engine. Okay. Um, all right, let's see if I talk about this. Okay, all right, I talked about that. <clears throat> 
So I'll make one, one more point about the technical detail here. Some of this is slightly forward thinking, but these are, you know, marketing is what marketing is. I'll try to make clear what's reality today and why we've named TensorFlow and CAFE and other libraries here, because that's where we're going, but I'll tell you exactly what's true at this moment. Mm -hmm. Soon, though, very soon. Um, So we're a distributed database, all right? If you've got large data sets, we spread the data across a cluster, okay? We actually, within, if you've got multiple GPUs within each box, we actually consider that the worker, so we actually shard data by GPU within a box and then across GPUs and other boxes. So we're a distributed database, okay? Wouldn't it be nice if you took, you had a machine learning library that you wanted to process a full data set on? And this is, this is the way it works now, as of what we just shipped. You drop your machine learning library, or better put, your own custom code, and I'll, I'll explain exactly what the, uh, the entry points in the code are, and you then are able to invoke your code from what looks like a database UDF or stored procedure call. We, I'll show you our API in a second here. We've got RESTful endpoints, and you just add another RESTful endpoint, and you call your code, your code can access data in the database. And we distribute your library across the database physically, like the way Hadoop would, would uh, pass a jar file around in a MapReduce job, right? We actually ship your code across the database. And each instance of your code is able to access that shard of data. So your code is actually able to run in parallel to process the large data set by operating in parallel. You still might need the equivalent of a reducer. You might still need some final global view, but you can, you can deploy these libraries in a, in a distributed fashion and in a non-distributed fashion. So, and your, your code can read and write to the database and it gets it through memory mapped files. So your code is actually able to read from shared memory to get the data. So this is what we mean by, we used to, you know, today, customers running custom CUDA code or libraries on GPUs and our database is running on GPUs. They're not sharing data. Or they're sharing data at the application level, right? I call the database, I pull back data over the wire, I feed it to my machine learning library, right, over its interface, right? So you can integrate them, but the integration at the application layer. So what we're doing is opening up, the, um, this is reminiscent of what uh, Apache Arrow tries to do, which is to say standardize on a shared memory format so multiple tools can operate on the same data in memory. So that's where we're going to. Right now, there needs to be a little bit of glue code that has not found its way into these products, and we haven't shipped it just yet, which is to allow something like uh, TensorFlow or CAFE or well-known third-party machine learning libraries. You can't drop them in just yet. We just need to write a little glue code to make this happen. So what we've shipped that's available now that I'll show you in just a second is uh, a Hello World project. We show you the, uh, the C++ interfaces that you can implement, but this allows, we had customers who actually, the reason we did it is we had customers who wanted to do it. You can deploy your own custom C++ code, or we were talking with Ryan from NVIDIA about if you have a, a Tensor RT or something that generates C++ code, deploy that. And it's a few lines of code to allow that code to be invoked and allow it to get data and put data uh, in our database. Um, our intention, though, is to provide wrappers so that third-party libraries can, uh, can just be dropped in. So you need a little layer of glue code to make that happen. Um, all right, so use cases. All right. I think I'm okay time-wise. I'm going to just, uh, we're, we're minutes from the demo here. So there's geospatial. So put it this way. Before that UDF stuff, I would have reserved the same sort of intensity of the presentation for our geospatial stuff, right? So, um, and I'll tell you, we've done a lot of this in the military, in the postal service, uh, locally at PG&E. Gas data, pipeline data. Uh, electric data. You got all that data. Many times it comes out of Esri systems, and Esri takes a long time to draw a picture of a million points. And we showed them we can draw you a million points, we can draw you a billion points, um, about a second. And this allowed an agile layer to be done on top of Esri environments or other geospatial environments. So um, if you have an X and a Y, a lat long, if you have some geospatial geotagging, you've got any of that type of coordinates, and you're trying to do geospatial analytics, you're looking for things like contains within, what's near, or you, wanna, um, you want to infer a track. I got these breadcrumbs. It's the same identifier, different X and Y, different timestamp. 
But if you find one point, you might immediately want to pursue the track so you can put together the logistics of it or the coordinates of a flight. We have native track support. So um, a lot of stuff the geospatial. Um, and we, we support all the open standards of web mapping service, um, uh, keystone markup language, um, well-known types uh, you, know, you can uh, store. And really what we do is, and I'll show you this in a demo any minute, is we're the vector data warehouse. We have the data, the points, the tweets, the XY stuff that we want to plot to generate heat maps and class break diagrams, things like that, on top of the raster data that you get from wherever, on top of Google Maps or you know, street views or things like that. So um, I will show you that. All right, the last part prior to the demo, where hopefully I haven't gone off the deep end here. Um, we've just released a new UI framework that allows you to much more easily take advantage of these things. Um, so I'll, show, I'll, I'll start with that by showing you the new Connecticut Reveal, which is a web-based uh, UI framework on top of this. OK, so there's pictures, but I'd rather show it to you. Uh, let's see. Oh, wait, there's more. All right. Uh, we get asked this question all the time. So uh, we're an in-memory database. You've got fine-grained control, attribute by attribute, what you need to keep in memory and what you can just store on disk, what doesn't need to chew up space in memory. The important bits need to be in memory. So if I'm doing group buys or aggregations on fields, they have to be in memory because that's how we work. Right? But if I've got a large payload, I will manage that value on insert. I'll retrieve it on select. I'll write it to disk like everything else. But um, I don't need to keep it in memory. And I can still do advanced uh, text analytics on it, but I can't do aggregate, I, you know, there's some things I can't do. We have to keep some stuff in memory. So um, we use main system memory, which, which allows us to say, I got a terabyte box, or I got a five to a half a terabyte, you know, RAM in a box. It allows us to do a, a good deal of processing per machine. Um, there's another strategy out of the market which says, well, if we sort stuff in VRAM, right, it'd be faster. And the point is, we agree, absolutely. If your data fits in the tens of gigs of memory in VRAM, as opposed to the 512 gigs or terabyte of main system RAM, absolutely. So we've got a feature now where if your data fits in VRAM, pin it in VRAM. And so um, um, we give you best of both worlds. We just say you can use main system memory, and if you want to pin stuff in VRAM, do it. The pattern that's emerged for this is classic star schema joins. We did a project for largest retail in the US, 150, a star schema, 150 billion transaction records joined against inventory data, um, customer data, location, weather to try to do uh, in, uh, stock analysis. Why are we out of stock? If we're out of stock, what's the closest place to replenish it? The fact table was 150 billion rows. That doesn't fit in VRAM. The dimensions were in the tens of millions of rows. Those fit in VRAM. So this is a nice pattern that we can support, which is pin your dimensions in VRAM and uh, do your star schema joins against main system memory. We also have customers who've just gone live who only had the smaller data sets, and they operate entirely in VRAM. So now we've, we've made it officially productized it. We've got VRAM boost mode. OK. All right, demo. Holy cow. Long time getting there, huh? OK, let's see if I can figure out how to get out of PowerPoint. There we go. All right, get rid of that. OK, as you probably suspect, this is the reveal UI. And in fact, I'm going to come right back to that. This is our admin tool, as you might have guessed. This is our DevOps tool, OK? I thought I'd show you this one first. This cluster looks like a 32 node cluster. Those are all GPUs. It's in a very small hardware footprint. It's got a lot of GPUs in it. Um, Tables, here, let's pick the Twitter table. Four billion rows, OK? And tables look like tables. Um, here's a peek of the data, but here. We present strongly typed schema on write tables. Not schema on read, not anything goes, and I love Hadoop, and there's a place for that. We look like a regular database. Well-known well -known primitives, long string, float, int, Double, we introduce things like that. Um, attributes, store only. That's the one which says, don't chew up memory. Text search, that's the one that says, do additional text indexing. So frankly, you don't need Elasticsearch or Solar. We implement those interfaces. You can put Kibana against us, because we look like a search. I mean, 
I'm sorry for this theme. I'm not really sorry, but I apologize for being clumsy here. When you have GPUs, you can do a lot of shredding of data. All right? So we don't need to index stuff going in. Just slam data in. All right? If we need to do it, so um, let's say, a I'm jumping around here, but here, let's say a query is slow, right? And you go to your DBA or your Hive administrator, why is my query slow? So, well, let's look at the query plan, right? Let's see what it did. Did it use an index, right? Oh no, it did the dread table scam. Like that's a bad pattern, right? Okay, for us, <coughs> like on this machine, I've got um, 64,000 GPU cores in a small bit of hardware, that's eight NVIDIA K80s, right? You know, is that right? Just, or 16, whatever, it's a small number. But the, the math is 64,000 GPU cores. When you do inserts into Kinetica, and inserts are distributed, they can be done across the cluster in real time, uh, like, like a NoSQL. I can write to all processes across all machines at the same time. And, uh, we store data in memory in small little columnar formats, so you get the benefit of columnar. But these are not huge files. They're small little chunks of columnar values. We just feed them to the GPUs. So essentially, that looks like a, if we have to do a table scan, it looks like 64,000 mappers running on data that's already in memory. So uh, it's sort of brute force in a way, but it's elegant. What it really means is you don't have to build an index. You don't have to maintain an index, which is very costly as more data comes in, keep an index in sync. High cardinality data sets are fine. So anyway, the, uh, back to this. I'll show you this table. The, the schema, the table schema, it's just an Avro schema. So here's the deal. Anyone here ever installed Hadoop? Right, it's, it's, a, it's a layer cake, isn't it, right? So we got one RPM, one config file, okay? So we walk in, we do a yum install, set a config file, grab an Avro schema, do a create table, and I'm ready to start inserting data, okay? Um, so here, let's look at that table, four billion rows. So here's one way to look at that table. Here's one way to look at the table. So this is, I'll do a reset. This is us generating, so this is Reveal, this is our new UI interface, of which we have one of our geospatial visualizations, rocking in the middle of it there. I can drill in. Every gesture I make is a call to our API to generate a new image, which is done server side, and about a 100K PNG file is returned to the browser or to the mobile device, right? So how do you do this? Uh, how do you visualize a billion points and support a mobile UI, right? Well, you need the image generated server side. So that's what we're doing there. So any filter I do, like let's, let, here, I'll zoom back out again. And here we're just looking, I still got four billion records in scope there. Um, let me drag a time filter, okay? Everything updates, I got fewer tweets. Um, let's, let's do a search on tweets um, with uh, word proximity. So this came up from that same retailer. Tire and rain within five words of each other. Eleven. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna release this filter, the time filter. So there are eleven at that time, but it's like what an analyst doing, right? I did some searches. I didn't find enough here. Bad demo. Okay, we got some right. So these are within these dates, twelve thirty one to twelve ten. Um, we, we found 437 records out of 4 billion records who tweeted that tire and rain within five words of each other. Um, and I can see, look, most of them are in Southern California. Let's, uh, let's zoom in there. Not surprising, right? Let's do a geospatial filter. Let's, let's, uh, let's do a freehand polygon. Let's see if I'm capable of doing that. So here... I'm trying to do a bunch of things at once, right, just to demonstrate. This is fast. This used our API, which was a well-known type, in this case a polygon, set of points captured by the JavaScript of the browser here, passed in, asking the database to answer the call contains, in a geospatial sense. Find me the points contained, and that's what's filtered us down now to 20 points. By the way, I can select that and drag that guy around. So, for example, if you're doing a street-by-street -street analysis or you, and you've got some geospatial shape that is interesting, right, you can do that type of, uh, you know, there's just a lot of things here. So I want to just give you a sense of that. Let me show you another way to look at the same data. Um, so here, IPython notebook, Jupyter. 
Um, just want to show you some code, finally. Holy cow. Uh, this is what it's like to program in Python against this database. Before I run that code, these are our public docs. All right, we just shipped version 6, been around for a while. Uh, here, look, in passing, uh, connectors. You'll find docs on Kibana, Kafka, NiFi, ODBC, JDBC. Talk to us with, you know, with the BI tool. Uh, uh, Spark, Storm, a lot of connectors there. Here's the API. So the API, the canonical API is a RESTful API. It's refreshing, right? It's just a REST API, stateless connection, REST API. We then auto-generate C++, Java, JavaScript, Node.js, and Python bindings, convenience wrappers around it. They don't get out of sync, they're auto-generated. Every time we push, we regenerate the bindings. I'm gonna use the Python API. I'll show you the rest just to give you a sense of the calls. Group by, uh, unique, uh, you know, all sorts of filters. Uh, filter by geometry. Filter by geometry, which has all these verbs like, uh, where are they? Cro contains, crosses, disjoint, equals, intersects, overlaps, touches within. So it's like a select statement. Select for me the points that are within the input well-known type, like a polygon that was passed in as an argument, right? Here's a polygon. Select for me the things that fall within it. It's a geospatial call, all right? So this reveal demo here, I think you get a sense as to what's going on. We're making one call to retrieve the mashed up vector data over the rasterized images. So for example, if I switch this to, uh, I don't know, Mapbox, you know, it'll redraw because it's only the, um, it's the raster that's changing underneath the vector data. When I do something like this, draw a circle, that's one of those API calls to contains where I'm passing in a circle, right? So you get a sense, and this is all just done in JavaScript APIs. Okay, so now Python. Okay, um, I'm hoping this works. This is the, the, right? There's no suspense showing in PowerPoint, right? Let's see if this works. Okay, so before I run it, let me find out if it works or not. Um, look, I do an import of GPU DB. I, I reference our module that I did a pip install GPU DB the prior name of the product. Um, I got one line that looks like I'm making a connection where I pass in the host name and a port, but I'm not actually making a connection. It's stateless, but I do need to figure out, I need to tell it where it is. Okay, I set the table as Twitter. I set the column to one of the double columns. And look, this is the API call, aggregate statistics. And I'm passing in just a bunch of string. Count, mean, standard, okay. Well, let's see if it works. So I run it, I, I set up the connection. Okay, I run it. And we're back. It took less than half a second, took 447 milliseconds. We touched four billion rows, and we calculated max, mean, min, skew, standard deviation, sum, variance. My, my cliche demo line, do you wanna see it again? Right? Sorry? No. <laughs> Appreciate the question. Notice I, 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 I took the bait, didn't I? Yeah. No, it's, it's not. It, uh, uh, maybe we're not smart enough, but no, we, we don't. It's not pre-computed. Um, invite you to, to test it. Um, and by the way, since my credibility is already shot, the way I took the... the uh, being a long-time database sales engineer, sorry, evil, supposed to... Um, we would do exactly that, right? I want to show you, I want to dazzle you with how fast Impala is, for example, or Presto, whatever it is, right? I'll run my query first, right? I'll run my query first privately, and then I'll run my query again, because that first query, loaded memory, it's cached. If it's, if it's operating as a file buffer cache, it's still cached, second query is faster, right? Our data is already loaded in memory across those machines. My second query shouldn't be any faster. We'll see. Let me see, let's see. Yeah, about the same, 451 milliseconds, right? Um, I mean, this, this is what it is. This is this small footprint, massively compute-dense, in-memory distributed database. Data spread out horizontally across machines, loaded in RAM, and fed to the lions like the GPUs. Okay, uh, here's an aggregation. Here's the New York City taxi data set. And here I'm gonna make a call aggregate group by. Okay, I mean, again, the API is pretty simple. Let's do an aggregate group by 
um, by the column names payment type and count. All right, credit card, cash, didn't pay. I don't know. I don't, let's see. Here, I'll clear, because obviously I was running these backstage. Let's, uh, let's clear all my outputs, and let's run it again. Boom, boom, boom. Okay. So that came back pretty quick. On, uh, I think it's 21, some billion of rows we could check. But here it is. The types are NA, dispute, unknown, no charge, credit, cash. And, and here's the values. So... Uh, not trivial, it's fast. Here's a histogram calculation. And this is the interactive bit. This, this is the type of thing I've seen data scientists do a lot when trying to do feature selection, right? They want to generate. So this is New York City taxi fair amount, and I just want to call histogram, and I want to look at um, values, like zero to, let's say zero to $30, and I want a histogram, I'll say every $5 is the interval. So let's run that puppy. Here's my result. So 0, what, 5, 10, 15, 20. So that's why I got those values there. That's the histogram. Man, eh, not enough values, not enough skew. Let's, let's say uh, 100 by 20. Let's r just run that again. Just run that next bit again. OK. So this is interactive histograms, aggregates, you know, stuff like that. Statistics, group buys, filters. I didn't set this up in the demo, but I'll mention something. It's very common for the analytics, regardless of language. The fact the database doesn't know I'm calling it from Python. This is all just hitting the database through its native API. As opposed to retrieving the results every time, pulling them back over the wire to my, like if I have a one-shot query, I want the results. Okay? But let's say I did a histogram, then I wanted to do an aggregation on the histogram, then I wanted to filter it, then I wanted to roll it up, and then I wanted to retrieve my result. I could set an option, notice these options here. I could, I could set an option called result table. That just returns to me a little binary flag, succeeded or failed, a couple other metrics, but keeps the results server side and, I can, and, and assigns a UUID to that result set. So I can use that UUID chain passed as an input to my next query. So this is called query chaining. It's not heavy because we call it a stencil. All it is is a bit mask of which rows pass the query. So if I have a base table of 4 billion rows and 1 billion of them passed my first filter, then we just have created a bit mask with a 1 or a 0 for each row that passed the filter and we, we give that, a, we return a UUID to the user and they refer to that as the, the target of their next query. And so you can just do query chaining and uh, you're pulling very little back over the wire. So, uh, so it's fun. Um, I'm going to get flagged here any second, I think. Let's see. I think you've seen most of this. Um, so here I'll expose really what I have on this new, maybe the reason why you guys showed up, the, uh, the AI integration. Um, so in our docs, this, this, this stuff is fresh. We, we just shipped it. We had it running in beta over the past couple of months, and it actually made it out into our product. So it's GA. It's supported. It's called user-defined functions, and I just wanted to show you, we call out the difference between distributed and non-distributed. I mentioned this, but the distributed one is push the library across the cluster and let it access shared memory for that shard of data so it can operate in parallel. It has to implement, so our first support is for C++. So, so look, today, if you were to jump on this feature, you would have to write some C++ code. You could call CUDA libraries, all right? You could do whatever you want, and we would invoke you with, with a memory mapped files so you could access data through shared memory, and you only have to, you have to implement a couple interfaces. Um, get request info, let's see, here we go. You implement this interface, uh, get input data, right? Chances are the reason why you would be deployed in this framework is you want to operate on data on the database. Okay, the way you get your memory wrap file is you implement this function called get input data. And then you just have a simple callback to tell us when you're done. Uh, you can get values. Where is it? It's like completion. Hang on. Duh. There it is. You gotta call, you gotta tell us when you're done, right? You have a call back to say, I'm complete. Now, in the meantime, you can also write back to data. So the pattern we expect is when we invoke your code in this distributed framework, it reads data, it operates on data, it writes the data back to the database. A subsequent call 
to, and this could be this, uh, this chaining again, a subsequent call might be non-distributed that could work against that result table, which is the, this is the, sort of like the map reducer pattern, right? This is where you can have a single global view of all of the shards. If, if, if I have a 10-node cluster and I got 10 processes and each one is working on data and each one writes a row and I got 10 rows, and if I need something to do a global mashup of those 10 rows, then I have a non-distributed one. So this is, you know, there's not too many moving parts here. When you register a library with us, we assign you, um, you can be called through our RESTful API then. It's, it looks like a database call and that's what happens. I'm, I'm sorry I don't have a demo of that right now, but that's, that's where that's going. So um, I think I should probably stop at this point. Uh, any questions or comments? Yeah? What's the space of the system? I'll show you. It's running. I wish it were on a DGX one. I'd be I'd be nicer to my host if it were, but I. Where can I pick that up? Uh, this is running. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, it's running on eight super micro boxes. Right. So it's running on some garden variety hardware. Right. Eight two eight two unit boxes. Right. It's like a third of a rack. It's not too big. Is, is, is that sufficient answer? Or? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, have you have you compared this to Spark SQL? Uh, what's your what was the performance and stuff? So, yes, a great deal. And in fact, we're, we've been on several occasions called in when a Spark SQL app uh, didn't perform as, as hoped for. And this is not a wrap on Spark SQL. So, um, not to be all mealy mouth, but there's, it's kind of apples and oranges. So put it this way, if I have a Spark pipeline that is well suited to reading data from wherever it's reading from, and it's doing a lot of operations that take advantage of Spark, and in line, I want to execute some SQL. Spark SQL is phenomenal for that, right? I mean, that's what it's made for. It's great. Is Spark SQL up to the task of being a long-running, huge, long-running process analytic database? No. Um, there's efforts in the Spark community to now leverage GPUs to try to get more parallel. To be, I mean, the whole point is it becomes compute-bound, right? This is this is the wrap against Spark SQL. It's, 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 it just it happens all the time. Again, I, I, I supported many a 300 node Spark SQL cluster. Um, what we've done in order sometimes politically to save face and sometimes because it's the right thing to do is we leave the Spark app in place and we just say, hey, what are you doing in Spark SQL? Are there certain bits of those where we can push that logic on the Kinetica? So we just use our Java API. We've got a Spark connector where we say, look, the benefit of an always on database so you pay a high serialization cost to, to move data from Spark to the GPU and back. So um, I know I'm kind of rambling my answer here. So the, the point is, I wouldn't make a blanket statement. Spark SQL serves many use cases well. But if what people really want is a lightning fast analytic database on streaming data that's always on, always available, um, sometimes the, you know, we'll get the call. Cool. Um, and actually, hold on. We're going to, sorry, I don't mean oh. to interrupt at all. We're going to actually start a panel for Q&A so we can get a couple other perspectives up here as well. So keep that question there for a second. Um, do we have Charlie Doyle here as well in the audience? Okay, great. So come on up, Charlie. Uh, John, could you come up here as well? We'll line you folks up here up against the wall, and then the whole crowd can just, you know, shoot their questions at you then. But at least we can hear from some of the NVIDIA folks as well. So, oh, almost forgot. Uh, while everybody files up here, uh, Mark and Michelle are going to be walking around with a, uh, a collection plate. So if you want to drop your business cards in there, we're going to be doing a raffle later. Uh, prize might actually be better than getting your own keys back. So please feel free to drop your business cards in there. I don't, I don't even know. Okay. <laughs> yes. No, please. Tell it to the crowd. Come on, before you go. Okay. Uh, I, 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 no. uh, I know that everyone gathered here for the data science, and this is up and coming um, profession and specialty. We're all engineers. So, uh, Action Sport is hosting data science bootcamp, and it's taught three sessions. The sessions are inter introduction, intermediate, and advanced. In advanced, you'll be taught the Lambda architecture, which was discussed. Uh, the sorting algorithms will be also taught. 
So I encourage you to attend. If you are looking and at the end, it will be a panel with recruiters. So bring the resumes. All right, so we have everybody up here. Um, was there, I, I know you had a question back there and I definitely want to make sure you get the chance to answer it. Now, um, MJ and Michelle, I believe, have some microphones for the recording, so if you don't mind, they'll probably pass you that so the whole audience can hear it. Oh, right there on your right. So please, fire away. Hi, um, I was wondering if you guys have array, do you support array as a data type? NumPy array or array, or, and do you have a nearest neighbor kind of um, uh, API or something like that? Questions for Kinetica? Yes. So I uh, sort of don't have an array type. One of the trade offs we made in figuring out how to feed the news really fast was to avoid complex types. So uh, we don't have an array data type currently. Any other questions? I saw a couple of hands going up. OK, there you go. Please. Here you go, right here, man. So basically, two questions. Um, um, when we see the P2 and P8, essentially, on Amazon, you have a 90 cent versus a $7 kind of a thing. Um, I want to understand if we try to take the $7 and try to run our data set through that, are we going to get a linear kind of a thing? So rather than waiting $9.09 for a long time, should we are better off just saying, this is my budget, run it to completion, and I'm happy with it so that I go faster? That's number one. Second, I want to understand the checkpointing, that when I try to checkpoint and then again try to restart, why I'm doing that is try to get spot instances and then essentially try to be conservative with the budget. I've been told that when once you do the checkpointing, it's basically you're doing the performance is a problem. So this is where I'm coming from. The hardware is expensive. It's hard to get hold of the hardware. Again, that's for Kinetica. Yeah. You know, I, so I, I, I think if I re, rephrase or understand that, I, I think the question is, if they were running Kinetica on Amazon instances, is it better for them to have one or two really fast instances or you know, eight to 10 slower instances? How is linear scale? You know, how, how do those things work? Thank you. Um, so one main consideration is how big your data set is to be meaningful. Right? And so in, uh, I've done most of my work on the P2-8x large, which is the middle one. I forget how much RAM's in the smaller one. Not much, right? Okay, but if it fits, that's fine. I mean, that, that's really the consideration, if it fits. Now, there may be some inherent advantages to running multiple small instances because one area that NVIDIA's NVLink can address, right, is you can saturate the PCIe bus. So if you run on a great big single fat instance, you may saturate the PCIe bus. So that's why the P216XL may perform worse than two P28X ones because I got twice the PCI bandwidth by having two separate boxes, right? Unless I wind up on the same box, I don't know. Um, so it's kind of hard to say. But I think you also were asking about persistence of data or resilience if you shut down. So here's what Kinetica does. When you, when you insert data into Kinetica, you get a response which guarantees the durability of your insert. Okay? And, and even, even though it's in memory, first it's written to disk. Okay? And you can be optimistic, do you get a disk sync or do you, are you pessimistic? Anyway, but anyway that's, that's a nuance. But um, if that disk goes away, <laughs> <laughs> Your data's gone away, essentially, right? So there are trade-offs then of e the quality of cloud storage, the speed. So you might want premium, you know, uh, storage, or if the, the, you might pay extra for provisioned IOPS if, if that's really important. But I've done a lot of work on uh, sort of out-of-the-box EBS storage with perfectly fine results. And I guess one, one uh, way to pull it is for initial POC work, Right? You could spin up one of the small ones and not hit a limit. If you hit a limit, go for two of the small ones or move to a P28X large. Use just EBS storage. At the point where production considerations and real durability, then we'd want to look closer at what your choices are for the storage layer. But, yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, looks like we have, is that a question in the back? Uh, just wondering, um, how is this uh, GPU DB uh, high availability architecture look like? Do you have HA capability? It looks like you have a uh, load balancer in front of uh, two or three or four mirrored instances of it, and we will handle, um, so that's active, 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 right? It can be uh, all active if you like. We'll handle the replication, the synchronization between the instances. So you can pull an instance out. Uh, th this is the current strategy. U.S. Postal Service, I think, has five-way active, 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 active. So essentially, load balancers in front, uh, what looks like an ESB in the back, so that if one of those mirrored instances is pulled offline, falls offline, is taken down for maintenance, is taken down to be patched, when it's powered up again, it checks in with the, uh, with the message bus to figure out what catch-up events it needs to then restore into memory before it will become operational. So that, that's our strategy. It, 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 it's, uh, it's built on some third-party technology, but it's not proprietary. And there's, there's no, I'm sorry, there's no zookeeper in it. No reliance on zookeeper. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Please. Uh, so you mentioned that the data was sharded, right? Uh, so I assume that plays a big role in performance and things like that. So uh, how do you determine how the sharding is done? Or So this gets to uh, also then the question of joins and distributed joins. So when you define a table, you have a flag to set whether the table is replicated or not. So if it's replicated, then it's not sharded and it's copied onto every sort of logical node, okay? It's so, uh, classic for a dimension table. For fact table, you can specify a shard key. You don't have to specify a shard key and we'll just do like a hash on, you know, what looks like the field. If you've got a primary key, we'll use that. Um, if you, you can specify a shard key as a column attribute, as a subset of the primary key, so you specify a shard key essentially, or you let us do it, okay? Um, here, just a couple of follow-on points. So when you shard, then the data is, sorry, shard, spread out across the nodes. Some, some rows are on some nodes, some rows are on others, the sum total of which makes up the table, okay? If I want to do joins on that sharded table, I got, Two choices. I can join freely against replicated tables because they're copied on every node. So all, I mean, the, the point is to avoid a distributed join that has to travel, traverse the network to, uh, to resolve, okay? So when I have uh, replicated tables, they're local on each shard. So that join is, every join is resolved locally. Or I can join non-replicated tables with a common shard key. So if I have multiple data sources uh, sharded by customer ID, shard keys are common, I can join them as well. And Thank you. It looks like there's another question. Oh, this is for Connecticut. Uh, you talked and showed applications using tables. Uh, do you have any experience uh, with streaming data and graphs? So, <laughs> so I was going to make the distinction between me, no, and others at our company, yes, which is to say, um, you are correct in that you saw a, a table interface. That's what we got, okay? But one could define a table as a vertex and one could store uh, nodes elsewhere. And in fact, we're in conversation with some graph databases who are looking to use us as the underlying store for them because we could actually service the request quickly. But if you were to look through our API, you won't see an obvious graph implementation where you can traverse a graph the API. So I'm gonna give you a partial answer, which is, I'm aware of others within Kinetica who have implemented graph functionality and are tracing graphs and are counting vertexes and things like that, but it's, it's their implementation on top of the API that, that you've already sort of called out. It looks like tables. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Um, so actually, I had a question. Um, earlier in the show, we show, meet up, um, we had mentioned something called Saturn V. Um, and we went on a pretty long talk about Kinetic, and we didn't really come back to that. So Charlie, question to you. Could you tell us a little bit about Saturn V and how that relates to somebody that's already using DGX1 for analytics? Yeah, so we had an, an interesting project here um, you know, at NVIDIA. We tend to try to use all of our own products internally. And, um, you know, our, our CEO, Jensen, you know, had a challenge to the company of 
how do we enable deep learning in every group? And so everyone started going off and doing deep learning in AI. But you run into a little bit of an IT problem there. You know, the, these systems are super powerful. They're great. If you look at a DGX1, you know, it's, you know, a supercomputer in a box. But you also don't run it in your cube. So we looked at, you know, how do we enable an infrastructure for the entire company modeled after what some of our large customers might want to do. And that became uh, the DGX Saturn V, which is 125 nodes. And when we put all that together, and it was done in about two months, and I learned way more about shipping and logistics and all that stuff than I wanted to in, the, in, in those couple of months. But my background is data center, so you know, I knew where everything needed to go. When we had this capability and we you know, unleashed it on our internal people, we said, you know, this looks an awful lot like a really big supercomputer. What if we just ran top 500 supercomputer tests? Where would we wind up? And so this system that we built in you know, under two months, we ran on the, the top uh, supercomputer list back in November at supercomputing. We came in 28th. And when you look at the numbers above us and below us, we for the supercomputing list, we, the result was based on 124 nodes because of the way the software works. They actually prefer an even number of nodes. but So you'll see in our literature 124 and 125. Um, but on 124 nodes on the, the top 500 list, we were number 28. If you look at the result above us and below us, there are thousands of nodes. They took a year to build, and it's an entire data center. You know, this is a row of racks. Um, but we enable that for all of our internal users to do deep learning so they don't try to put a DGX1 under their desk and blow up their cube. Um, but we also said, you know, how can we leverage this power out to the community? Because uh, NVIDIA has in, involved a lot of research. So we got involved with the Cancer Moonshot Project because we've got some of, you know, the world's best deep learning framework researchers working for us. Um, and the Cancer Moonshot was looking at building a new deep learning framework for cancer. Uh, so on the, the Saturn V infrastructure, we're giving access to the Cancer Moonshot researchers. We're giving our expertise on uh, the Candle project to help build that deep learning framework. But it's also served as a jumping off point for a number of our customers. Because when we built this, we said, you know, this you know, video is a big company, 10,000 people. You know, this looks like about the power for all those people to, to use internally. And the number of customer requests that we got to say, hey, could we just buy one of those or could I buy half one of those for a quarter? Um, it served as a good reference architecture. And we've got some good uh, new information coming out, some, some webinars and uh, some white papers of how you actually cluster these systems together. Because I think of some of the points that the Connecticut team brought up, as you try to scale out across systems, you do run into network limitations and other things, and their, their implementation's been very good scaling out. We've taken that a step further on the DGX technology that it's multi-InfiniBand connected to even get that lower latency so you can build a multi-massive scale cluster. I think we've got a question over there. What application are, are your people using that are GPU-enabled? Uh, so it, it's a wide range of applications. Uh, we all of our deep learning for automotive. Many of you've seen our self-driving car, at least in videos. Um, Custom, your in-house built, or are they are they things I would recognize like Spark or Storm? No, they're, they're, they're typical deep learning and high performance computing workloads. So you know it's running deep learning training on you know a cafe or a TensorFlow or a CNTK. Uh, it may be doing traditional HPC. Um, supercomputing workloads, you know, testing out new applications for you know, physics applications, thermodynamic, other things like that. Uh, we use it internally for chip design. You know, and the interesting thing is, you know, all the chip designers, you know, that we've had you know, for years and years, there's just that institutional knowledge, what's a good design, what's a bad design. If I look at a chip, you know, really smart chip designer, you can just look at something and go, you know, that's not going to work quite right. Um, but that's a deep learning problem. You fed all that image data into it, and as you're working on new designs, you can just send in your new design, and the system can give you a quick inference to read of, yeah, you're probably going in the right direction, or you know, circle the red spot. No, you, you may want to look at that, that area. So we use it in all aspects for business. We, we use it in um, marketing. You're seeing, you know, for advanced analytics, you're starting to see more and more marketing types of applications using deep learning and AI to better serve our customers, you know, our GeForce customer base. I think you're misunderstanding my question. My question isn't what it's the use cases or what businesses are used it. I want to know what off-the-shelf frameworks can I go and get that are already GPU enabled yeah, that um, I can start programming to. Like so I program to Hadoop and to Spark, you know. Uh, 
Right, so the traditional um, AI and deep learning workloads are um, frameworks like CAFE, TensorFlow. You're starting to see Spark. I haven't heard about Spark. Yeah, so the, the, you know, if you're doing any deep learning, you know, it, there's multiple frameworks out there, whether you're doing image processing, natural <coughs> research, text processing, or well, what you're seeing in the world of you know, Spark and some of those other more traditional applications that you're, you're talking about, a lot of those companies are looking at how they add GPU technology to those frameworks because they are hitting bottlenecks that GPUs could solve. That's not production yet, so if you're using Spark, you'll see some talk on the Spark threads and aliases about where they're adding things, where they're thinking about things, but you can't download that today. Um, so deep learning is more, you know, if you look up in, you know, deep learning frameworks, you'll see the list at the top in you know, five or seven. Mark, we have another question there. So we have gone from uh, CPUs to GPUs, and then when you look at True North, I don't know if you have seen that framework where they have gone with uh, clock, uh, clockless architecture. And to be able to run on the True North, the programming languages have to be changed. There's a lot of framework that change, but you have an order uh, magnitude of savings in the probably like two orders of magnitude saving in the heat consumption. So do you see something like that NVIDIA moving in that direction eventually? Um, so I, I'll be honest, I, I, I'm not you know, super familiar with, with True North. I think there's a lot of alternate designs that people are talking about in the market, whether that's you know, ASIC or you know, other you know, field programmable gate arrays. There's been a lot of great research and people that are doing cutting edge work in deep learning and they've all kind of looked at those things and decided GPUs are the way to go because when a problem is very well known, you can build a specific piece of silicon on it. I mean, that's you know pretty much the way our entire industry you know has has gone. You know, when you look at networking, you look at security systems. When I know an exact problem, I can program a little piece of silicon. Even Google did some of the same things. But the field of AI, the field of deep learning, is changing. Even the best frameworks, the best framework from last year, is maybe the third best today. So. As we're looking at deep learning, AI, advanced analytics, you need a generally easy to program system. And the, the GPU, with all the work that we've done in programming in CUDA and applications and making, you know, when the, the question about what applications run on it, you know, 10 years ago, if you started doing deep learning, you had to program your own deep learning inside of the framework using GPUs. Now every deep learning framework is CUDA enabled. So, you know, in terms of, you know, our direction, you know, we're clearly you know, on the GPU. We see tremendous value there, and the general purpose nature of it allows businesses to grow. I mean, if GPUs weren't there and you, know, you guys had to start and said, I'm going to program a custom piece of silicon, you know, that's a long road to go. Anyone can pick up a GPU. You can pick up you know, a $500 card, a you know, $1,000 Titan card, or a you know, $100,000 system, and it's the same programming model on all of them. Um, so there's a lot of talk in the industry. You know, I think We'll see where those things go, but um, every all signs point to GPUs are going to be around for a very long time, long after I retire. <laughs> a couple more questions. Can I just can I say one Please more comment? No. So um, this is the reverse question, which is our point of view has been, and we love CUDA. I got to tell you, I mean, right, this is no question. I agree with everything, but just to say this, for the business developer who wants to leverage GPUs. You can use SQL, right? You can use Python, you can simulate AI. So our, our only point was you had agreeing with everything yeah. there, but, but to roll it up higher for developer productivity, yeah, that's our, yeah. yeah. That's, that's what I was getting Yeah, to. okay. Yeah, a couple more from the back. Uh, I just have one quick question. Uh, basically, the SNEA conference just finished, and one of the highlights of the conference, at least for me, was the talks about the persistent memory. So you were talking about distributed memory, but now Samsung and others are talking about the persistent memory applications and a flowed in GPUs. So what's your take on that? Don't jump at once. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to play the, uh, I know a lot about a lot of things. Uh, I don't know much about persistent memory. So uh, I, I, I don't have an answer for you. We can follow up with you on, on that. But um, I, I've not heard that come up in, in other conversations. Yeah, uh, I mean, deep learning, you know, you typically use it for like object recognition, text, or like, you know, context, or video analysis, or 
I, I kind of want to know what, where you see, what use cases do you see uh, for uh, a database to play a role in that, uh, especially with GPU acceleration? Well, I, I think it's all connected. And, you know, at any data scientist doing deep learning, one of the first challenges, you know, kind of first principles is, do I have labeled data? Well, where's the best place to get labeled data? In a database, uh, and that's been a big problem in deep learning is you know tons of image data and it's not labeled. If my data exists already in a database, I have a label. I can then train on that much more easily. I don't need to do the data prep. So I think the two are tightly coupled, um, and that's where we're seeing a lot of advances in deep learning where. People used to look at, you know, ImageNet and those other things where you've got a deeply trained data set. When you think about where the industry is going, the breakthroughs in healthcare, well, what does healthcare have? You know, tons of image data with tons of label attributes on it. So all those things lend themselves very nicely to, you know, a fast database application. And the more that the researchers, and I think, um, you know, the Connecticut guys brought this up, that the researchers have access to that database and they don't have to copy data out and other things. I think there's an, a natural marriage there. Do you have an answer? Yeah, I mean, I'll add this. What, what drove us to add that framework was customers who had, and this was actually um, automobile racing, who get a lot of signals from cars and they want to apply um, models very quickly for things like car tuning, right? So it's, a, it's almost like an IoT use case where the plumbing, landing new data, right, whether it comes through Kafka, whatever the, the database plumbing is, being able to do analytics, being able to do traditional, and I'm sorry for repeating, being able to do like traditional database analytics on it, and then at the right point, feed it to your model, have your model act on it, have your model return a result, right, would require, you know, the, the characteristics I described, which is you want a way operationally to deploy it, where each part of your model gets a shard, You'd want a shared memory framework so you're not actually passing data around over the wire, network, or disk. Those are the motivations we had. I'll confess, we look forward to finding out which ones are actually the best fit. You know? So we're enabling the capability, and we are sort of following up with those of our customers who pushed us to do it to see where it goes. I had a conversation, I'll confess, I don't know much about it, but I think it was uh, TensorFlow RT. It was a model that you might train up offline generate C++ and deploy the model at runtime. And this is where we could do this, to, we could do that today. We could deploy that code today. So. All right, so uh, unfortunately we're getting the, the wrap it up signal from the back, but um, I wanted to thank everybody for coming out to this meetup. And I also wanted to thank NVIDIA uh, for opening up this, this office to us to come and meet here. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this is part of a series, so we are gonna get back together in February. And I actually anticipate a couple of different announcements out of both partners in between now and then. So you can follow us up Follow us on meetup.com, but, you know, keep an eye out for things, and we hope to see you at the next one. And before you go, um, you know, one more offer to add your business card to the bucket. <laughs>